Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Welcome back from the break. This is the second segment of Shabbat service for Waymaker Messianic Jewish and Christian Center in USA. We welcome everyone who is here with us today. And for those who will listen in later on the archives as well, we pray that this is a blessing to each and every one of you. It is Saturday, October 1st, 2022 on the Gregorian calendar and on the Hebrew calendar year of 5783. It is the sixth day of Tishrei, uh, also the sixth day of awe or what is known as the sixth day of repentance. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will be glad and rejoice in it. I'm going to just recap on a couple of our announcements. Again, we are continuing our Bible study and using the English Standard Version of the Bible. We are going to read the entire book of Nehemiah this week. Uh, also, we have Yom Kippur service coming up. And um, I, just to also mention this, I didn't mention this in the first half. Um, this is a fast day. It is a high holy day, but it is also a fast day for us, 25 hours of fasting. Um, and it is it is a very um, it is a very um, sober day of uh, as far as the high holy day. This is when the books are closed. This is this time period between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is a time of repentance, making sure that you are right with God, um, and it does affect the the, the following the, this year of 5783. This is also the year of Jubilee. Um, so um, that we just had ended a Shamita year. It's a seven, well, the seven, seven year cycles uh, we, we end, but um, the Jubilee year is like the 50th year. So we are there um, this year. So, so we have Yom Kippur service also on Tuesday evening. Um, actually, there's a lot going on. I, I'm actually going to probably post Yom Kippur service um, on Tuesday. Uh, and um, we also have our weekly meeting on freeconferencecall.com at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time Tuesday evening as well. So, um, you're welcome to come join us. Uh, you can join by phone or by website. And again, um, I post to our four social media platforms how to do that. I will post an annou announcement. Within that announcement, there's two links. The first link is the phone access. Um, and this is a free list that was given to us, <laughs> regardless of the fact that it says toll calls for every every country, including the United States. There, it's not a toll. Uh, there's no tolls. You would dial your in-country number and then uh, add the access code, and that will bring you into the conference room. Don't forget to um, to add, after you add the access code, to do the pound sign. Um, also, if you join by web, you would need to download the web app or the phone app and then run the exec and follow the prompts into the room. There is a uh, there is a built in microphone camera and chat room so um, that you can uh, partake in if you join that way. We use this channel uh, to fellowship to talk about current events and how they relate biblically to lift up prayer requests. We're also doing classes and we've also hosted musicians, um, praise and worship leaders and uh, praise and worship musicians, I should say, and writers that are writing for the kingdom of heaven. So uh, if that is a ministry that you're involved in and you're doing something special or want to promote your music or your writing uh, and you'd like us to host you, host you, you could certainly reach out to us. We have the ability to do MP3 and MP4 recordings. I have done them in the past and then emailed those recordings to, to, the, to those that we hosted. So then you can take that and and use it any way that you choose. Um, but um, we do have that that uh, offering and it's our ministry's way of tithing into yours and promoting what you do because we're all working together for one purpose and that is we are ambassadors for the kingdom of God and we, we need to um, do that great commissioning and get the gospel out to every corner, nook and cranny of this planet. Uh, so we can go home with the king. Amen. Amen. So with that being said, that is um, 
all the announcements I have for this upcoming week. And I'm going to open with our opening prayer for the second segment of Shabbat. And we're going to get right into the Brit Kaddashah scriptures. And then we will get into an altar call and then do Holy Communion and close out Shabbat service then. Avina Malkina, our Father, our King, we thank you. We thank you that you are such a wonderful Heavenly Father. You've given us the perfect example of resting on the seventh day. And this is the seventh day. It is Saturday, our seventh day of the week. And this is the day that you have sanctified as holy. You gave us that perfect example with creation. You worked six days and you've rested on the seventh. And you included this in the 10 words or the 10 commandments that we are to keep Shabbat. And, and the foreigners within our midst are also, that, that give themselves to Adonai, that are saved and born again, should keep Shabbat and keep it holy. And we love you, Father God. We worship you. We adore you. And we ask your Holy Spirit to continue to lead us through the entire Shabbat service. Open the eyes of our heart and the ears of our heart that we may be perfect receptacles to take in your word, to ingest it, digest it, and work with your word as we walk with you every day. We love you, Father God. We give you all our praise, our honor, and our glory. In the name above all names, the mighty, most precious, powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray. Amen and amen. And in the ancient days, the high priest sounded the shofar, calling Benaiah Israel, the children of Israel, to worship. And we are going to sound the shofar as well. I am going to pause it now for you to listen to some praise and worship songs. Again, uh, as a reminder, we do not include them in the recordings on part one and part two of Shabbat because um, of potential issues with where we post. And we the, apparently there, you know, when we first started uh, recording Shabbat and posting it, um, there were a lot of issues with other people, uh, other ministries and such, and they were getting kicked off of places. And so we just chose to not do it at all. And we've continued to, to not. Um, but I do want to say that praise and worship is one of the most important elements of any service. And absolutely, we do praise and worship. Uh, we were born to praise and worship our Creator that's what we're created to do. And that's what we're going to be doing in eternity. So yes, it is very, very important. Um, what I do when I post everything to social media platform, this is how I usually post it. I will post, you know, this uh, post it in order. If you follow the order that I post, um, I will post a Shabbat Shalom. I will post the scriptures and then I will post a set of songs and that the first set of songs can go to part one of Shabbat. So the, after after that first set of songs, I usually have posted um, part one and part two of Shabbat. And then I'll post another set of songs. And that second set of songs can go to part two, of course. Um, and then that's pretty much um, my postings for um, for the week. And I well, I will post Shavua Tov, have a good week to, to close out Shabbat. Um, and that's how, that's how it's always posted on the four social media platforms. Now I always look for the silver lining and there's a positive to this by doing this, you're clicking on to the actual artists, um, YouTube channels. Um, so you can actually get familiar with other songs that they do you please please support what they do a lot of times you're going to find links that you can actually click on to and to purchase their music um, 
these songs that are that I select for Shabbat service are very highly anointed. They're excellent for praise and worship. And um, so definitely, uh, you know, I, I do promote them and please support them. They do an excellent job for the kingdom of heaven. And so this is what their their passion is and this is what they do. And so support support our musicians that do such an excellent job for us and give us wonderful praise and worship songs. And that's all I'm going to say about that. I'm going to pause so you can do some praise and worship. And then we're going to come back and do the Brit kind of shop readings. And then, like I said, get into um, the altar call, Holy Communion and closing out Shabbat service for this week. So I'm going to pause right now. Okay, we've got four areas that we're going to read from, from the Brit Kadashah, the New Testament or the New Covenant. Brit Kadashah uh, actually means New Covenant. So actually our four readings, three of them are actually from the book of Romans. Um, but the first one is from Matthew um, chapter 18, verses 1 to 35. Childlike humility. At that hour, the disciples came to Yeshua saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called the child to himself, set him in the midst of them, and said, Amen. I tell you, unless you turn and become like children, you shall never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then shall humble himself like this child, this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who trust in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be sunk in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of snares. And look at our world today, how the the focus is to mess up our the children in our world. Um, and that is really very sad. But understand what Yeshua is saying. Woe to the world because of snares, for snares must come, but woe to that man through whom the snare comes. For those that mess up these the, the children and cause them to stumble. And if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away from you, it is better for you to enter into life crippled or lame than having two hands or two feet to be thrown into fiery Gehenna. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it away from you, it is better for you to enter into life with one eye than having two eyes to be thrown into fiery Gehenna. The parable of the lost sheep. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a certain man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, won't he leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go looking for the one that is straying? And if he finds it, amen, I tell you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that didn't stray. Well, they've been faithful. This is the one that has gotten away and he wants, he doesn't want him lost. In other words, he doesn't, you know, when you look at this parable, he doesn't want, the Lord does not want anyone to, to spend eternity in hell. In other words, so he will pursue and, you know, through the Holy Spirit, send people to try to, to to try to talk to these people to come to the Lord. Even so, it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost, restoring a lost brother. Now, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault while you're with him alone. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen, take with you one or two more, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may stand. But if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to Messiah's community. And if he refuses to listen even to Messiah's community, let him be to you as a pagan and a tax collector. Amen. I tell you, whatever you forbid on earth will have been forbidden in heaven. And what you permit on earth will have been permitted in heaven. Now, other Bibles will say, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is part of spiritual warfare. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. Lessons about forgiveness. Then Peter came to him and said, Master, how often 
shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Yeshua said to him, no, not up to seven times, I tell you, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle up, a man was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But since he didn't have the money to repay, his master ordered him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. Then the slave fell on his knees and begged him, saying, Be patient with me, and I'll repay you everything. And the master of that slave, filled with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. Now that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and he grabbed him and started choking him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell down and kept begging him, saying, Be patient with me, and I'll pay you back. Yet he was unwilling. Instead, he went off and threw the man into prison until he paid back all he owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply distressed. They went to their master and reported in detail all that had happened. Then summoning the first slave, his master said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave all that debt because you pleaded with me. Wasn't it necessary for you to show mercy to your fellow slave, just as I showed mercy to you? Enraged, the master handed him over to the torturers until he paid back all he owed. So also my heavenly father will do to you, unless each of you from your hearts forgives his brother. And that is the end of the first Brit Kadasha reading. And we're going to go to the book of Romans. Like I said, there's three areas in the books, book of Romans that we're going to read from. The first one is actually Romans chapter 1, verse 1 to 32. So it's the first chapter, introducing Paul and his message. Paul, a slave of Messiah Yeshua, called to be an emissary and set apart for the good news of God, which he announced beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son. He came into being from the seed of David. According to the flesh, he was appointed Ben Elohim, the son of God, in power. According to the Ruach of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, he is Messiah Yeshua, our Lord, through him, we have received grace and the office of emissary to bring about obedience of faith among all the nations on behalf of his name. And you are also called to Yeshua, the Messiah, to those in Rome loved by God, called to be Kedeshim. Grace to you and shalom from God, our Father and the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, eager to visit. First, I thank my God through Messiah Yeshua for all of you because your faithfulness is made known throughout the whole world, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the good news of his son, how unceasingly I make mention of you, always pleading in my prayers, if somehow by God's will now at last I will be granted a good journey to come to you. For I long to see you, so I may share with you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is to say, we would be encouraged together by one another, faithfulness, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that many times I plan to come to you though I was prevented until now, so I might have some fruit among you also, just as I have among the rest of the nations. I have an obligation to both Greeks and barbarians, to the, both the wise and the foolish, so I am eager to proclaim the good news also to you who are in Rome. The righteous shall live by faith. For I am not ashamed of the good news, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who trusts, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Now, he was addressing the non-Jew as, as Greek. Uh, it is it, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from trust to trust, as it is written, but the righteous shall live by emuna. Emuna means faith. Yet all are guilty, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. In unrighteousness, they suppress the truth, because what can be known about God is plain to them, for God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen ever since the creation of the world being understood through the things that have been made. So people are without excuse, for even though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give him thanks. Instead, their thinking became futile and their senseless hearts were made dark. But we can see some of those people in our world today who claim to be their own God, which they're not. Um, and they want to remove God from everything. That 
talks about those people in our world today. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for an image in the form of mortal man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them over in the evil desires of their heart to impurity, to dishonor their bodies with one another. They traded the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And yes, this is very strongly right now in our world today. You can see it. So we need to stay separate from the world. We are we are in the world, but not of it. So just remember that we we need to to take heed to to these things because again, they were going on in, in, in Paul's time, but they, they were they are certainly going on even stronger today because there's 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 so much disrespect for our our, our heavenly father for this reason god gave them up to shameful passions even their women extremes exchange natural relations for what is against nature and you know what that is in reference to likewise the men have abandoned natural relations with women and were burning with passion towards one another men committing shameful acts with other men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error and just as they did not see fit to recognize God, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do what is not fitting. They became filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil. They are, are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanders, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. They are foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve death. They not only do them, but also approve of others who practice the same. Now, I just want to address this for just a moment because I hear a lot of people say, oh, well, that, that was in the Old Testament that that was addressed. No, it's also repeated right here in the book of Romans. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If something was made... It was stated is an abomination to him. Then it is an abomination. Now he's not going to change just because we're in the 21st century. Um, people want to think, oh, well, we're living in modern times. No, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, as Solomon, King Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, nothing new under the sun. You know, unfortunately, um, <laughs> humanity seems to repeat the same mistakes of the past. and so. Yes, it was in the Old Testament, but yes, it's also repeated in the New Testament because God is never changing. Just because you have changed doesn't mean God's going to change. And just because you want things to be a certain way, you can't rationalize your way into making God change his ways. His ways are much higher than ours. And if he calls something an abomination, it is an abomination and it is a sin. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 to 25. Two laws at war, or do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I speak to those who know law, that the law is master over a person as long as he lives. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if the husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then if she is joined to another man while her husband is living, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so she is not an adulteress though she is joined to another man because she fulfilled because the vow of the marital law, the, the marital vow was, was upheld till death do you part. So if the husband dies, then yes, she's free to marry someone else and vice versa. The, the husband is the same way if the wife would die. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were made dead to the Torah through the body of Messiah, so that you might be joined to one another, the one who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions that came through the Torah were working in our body parts to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to what can find us, so that we serve in a new way of the Ruach and not in the old way of the letter. The law is within us through the Holy Spirit, though. The Torah is placed in our heart because um, Jesus didn't, you know, Yeshua didn't, didn't 
say abandon abandon it, um, but he has um, released us. But you know, we're not following the letter; we're following the Holy Spirit. What shall we say then? Is the Torah sin? May it never be. So here, here Paul goes on to say, no, the Torah is not, following Torah is not sinful. May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the Torah. The Torah was a teacher until Yeshua came. For I would not have known about coveting if the Torah had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking the opportunity, worked in me through the commandment of all Commandment all kinds of coveting, for apart from the Torah, sin is dead. Once I was alive from the from the Torah, but when the commandment came, sin came to life and I died. The commandment meant for life was found to cause death. Sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So then the Torah is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Therefore, did that which is good become death to me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin working death in me through that which is good, so that sin might be shown to be sin, and that through the commandment sin might become utterly sinful. For we know that the Torah is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold to sin, for I do not understand what I am doing, for what I do not want, this is this I practice, but what I hate, this I do. But if I do what I do not want to do, then I agree with the Torah that it is good. So now it is no longer I doing it, but sin dwelling in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For to will is present in me, but to do the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but the evil that I do not want, this I practice. But if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I doing, but the sin that dwells in me. So I find the principle that evil is present in me that the one who wants to do good, for I delight in the Torah of God with respect to the inner man, but I see a different law in my body parts, battling against the law of my mind and bringing me into bondage under the law of sin, which is in my body parts. Miserable man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death. Thanks be to God. It is through Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself serve the Torah of God, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. And the last passages are Romans chapter 9, verse 1, through Romans 10, verse 21. So we're actually going to read chapters 9 and 10 of Romans. The role of Israel, I tell the truth in Messiah, I do not lie, my conscience assuring me in the Ruach. Hakadesh, that my sorrow is great and the anguish of my heart unending, for I would pray that I myself were cursed, banished from Messiah for the sake of my people, my own flesh and blood, who are Israelites. To them belong the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the Torah and the temple service and the promise. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, the Messiah who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. It is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all those who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor are they all children, because they are Abraham's seed. Rather, your seed shall be called through Isaac. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God. Rather, the children of the promise are counted as seed. For the word of promise is this. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but also Rebekah having twins from one act with our father Isaac. Yet before the sons were even born and had not done anything good or bad so that God's purpose and choice might stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob, I love, but Esau, I hated. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be for to Moses, he says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the one who wills or the one who strives, but on God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you. So my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whom he wills and he hardens whom he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For 
who has resisted his will? But who in the world are you, O man, who talks back to God? Will what is formed say to the one who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Does the potter have no right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honor and another for common use? Now, what if God, willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath designed for destruction? And what if he did so to make known the riches of his glory on vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory? Even us, he called not only from the Jewish people, but also from the Gentiles, as he says also in Hosea, I will call those who are not my people, my people, and her who is not loved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. So this is, this is like a prophecy that the Gentiles were coming in uh, as well, that they were not called um, my people you know, Adonai's chosen, um, but it was going to open to them. Israel cries out, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of Benai Israel be as the sand of the sea, only the remnant shall be saved. For Adonai will carry out his word upon the earth, bringing it to an end and finishing quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, unless Adonai Sabaoth had left us seed, we would have become like Sodom and resembled Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, that it is a righteousness of faith? But Israel who pursued a Torah of righteousness did not reach the Torah? Why? Okay, and, and the reason is this. Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were from works. They stumbled over the stone of stumbling, just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, who, and whoever believes in him shall not be put to shame. And this is speaking of Yeshua. They stumbled over this. Chapter 10. Misdirected zeal. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire, my prayer to God for Israel is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not based on knowledge. For being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit themselves to the righteousness of God. For Messiah is the goal of the Torah as a means to righteousness for everyone who keeps trusting. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on Torah, that man who does these things shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will go up into heaven, that is, that is to bring Messiah down. Or who will go down into the abyss, that is to bring Messiah up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we are proclaiming. For if you confess with your mouth that Yeshua is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart it is believed for righteousness and with the mouth it is confessed for salvation. And we are going to get into the altar call um, and talk about that a little bit more in just a little bit. For the scripture says, whoever trusts in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction, distinction between Jew and Greek, between Jew and non-Jew. For the same Lord is Lord of all, richly generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls upon the name of Adonai shall be saved. How then shall they call on the one in whom they have not trusted? And how shall they trust in the one they have not heard of? And how shall they hear without someone proclaiming? And how shall they proclaim unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim good news of good things. But not all heeded the good news. For Isaiah says, Adonai, who has believed our report, so faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Messiah. But I say, have they never heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out into all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation, with a nation empty of understanding. I will vex you. And that's really what what the Gentiles are doing, is provoking, provoking our people to come to Yeshua. Um, and Isaiah is so bold as to say, 
I was founded by those who did not seek me. I became visible to those who do not ask for me. But at Israel, he says, all day long I stretch forth my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. And I do want to say that there's a lot of our people that are coming, coming to Messiah Yeshua and, and realizing that he is a, the Jewish Messiah. And, and he came for it, the, the lost house of Israel. That was why he had come. But things did get opened up to the Gentiles as well. And that is the end of our Brit Kadashah reading. We're going to do a quick recap and then um, of, of everything. And then we're going to get into the altar call and to Holy Communion. In again, in last week's Parashat Nitzavim, Moses formally gathered the people of Israel together to ratify their covenant with the Lord. And Moses then fled with the people to choose life by pursuing the path of obedience to the Torah and its commandments. If B'nai Israel would do so, they would be blessed and prosper as God's chosen nation. But if not, they were cursed with exile, persecution, and the threat of utter destruction. So that was last week. And in this week, um, Vailek, and he went. Moses is letting the people know, I am 120 years old today, can no longer go forth and come in. And the Lord confirmed that he was soon to die, and Joshua was or ordained as the successor to lead the people into the promised land across the Jordan River. Moses urged Joshua and the people to be strong and courageous, Kazak, and to place their full trust in Adonai. Um, and then the Lord called Moses and Joshua into the tent of meeting so Joshua could be commissioned as the successor. And he was in front of the people. Um, and also there was the song of Moses, which we're going uh, to, that, that's a spoiler alert. That is going to be next week's Parashat uh, Torah portion. You will get to hear the song of Moses. Um, Moses gathered the people together to teach them this song. Um, Again, the other thing that was that was brought about was um, the what what would happen in the future that the people would turn to other gods and 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 bad things would happen because of it. Um, so we know that that God was already telling them what the people would do. Now the half Torah uh, is connected with the theme of the ten days of repentance um, and there was a clarion call to Teshuva to turn back to God, to repent. And this, and the second part uh, and another part is the Lord warned the people of that, the, that a locust attack was coming to destroy the land, but Joel was sent to appeal to them to repent. However, repentance must be wholehearted with fasting and weeping with rending of the heart instead of outward garments. And happily the people did repent and the Lord greatly restored the people and the land. And also, um, it, in Micah, uh, it is stated, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. And, and that God will not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy and steadfast love and will again have compassion and will tread the iniquities underfoot. And will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. Will show faithfulness to Jacob, steadfast love to Abraham, as was sworn to our fathers from the days of old. And in the Brit Kadashah, we just read um, um, we had just um, read about what had happened as Paul was addressing the people in Romans and 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 the abominations and and all the things that, you know, that the people were doing. And there's an appeal to the believer in Messiah Yeshua to share the message of the Lord's redemptive love with all the world. And this, this is recapping really quickly the Brit Kadashah. Um, ethnic Israel, beloved as she is of God, had undergone a partial hardening until all of those whom the Lord has called from among the nations have been grafted in to the covenant promises originally given to Israel. After this time, all Israel will indeed be saved. 
and the chosen nation will once again be restored and fully forgiven. Then the words of the prophets will all come true, and Israel will be adorned with honor and blessing above all the nations of the earth. Our eschatological brethren will finally be home from their long exile. And this is referring to those who have not accepted Yeshua as their Lord and Savior. And that is all I'm going to say about that. And that concludes the Torah, the half Torah, and the Brit Kadashah readings for this week. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your most powerful word. We thank you that you're a merciful God. And even though we have strayed and you have given us Yeshua, the Messiah, to redeem us and reconcile us to you. And even so, we're still not perfect in our fleshly bodies. And you know that. And you're a merciful God. And we are so grateful for that. We thank you for all that you do. We love you. We worship you. We adore you. We give you all our praise, honor, and glory in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Amen and Amen. We started speaking about salvation in, in the Brit Kadashav readings. And yes, Yeshua, his very name, his Hebrew name Yeshua means salvation. Salvation can only be achieved through the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, who actually was the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. He did this for the purpose of redeeming us from sin forever taking that sin away. Prior to his coming, there had been a sacrificial system that was put in place. You could see that there was a type and shadow in the Old Testament where blemish-free, perfect little lambs and other animals were sacrificed to cover the sins of the people. Because the wages of sin are death and separation from our Creator. And if you die in your sin, you will be separated forever from our creator. Yes, there is a heaven. Yes, there is a hell. And understand that you do have a choice. Salvation is deliverance from sin and, there, and the consequences of that so that you can have eternal life. Our Lord and Savior, Yeshua, took all the sins of the world with him when he laid down his life on the cross so that the world could be redeemed of sin forever and we could finally be reconciled to our creator, to the Father. Without that, that would not happen. We cannot save ourselves. You cannot work your way to heaven. You can't buy your way to heaven. There's nothing you can do. It's already been done through Yeshua. His work on the cross did it all. He paid our sin debt in full. Everyone who has ever walked on the face of this planet, he took on every sin. And it could be as simple as a, a sin, a thought that is sinful in, in, in the face of a holy God. And you know, our God is holy and sin cannot stand before a holy God, period. So it needed to be addressed. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of the original sin that occurred in, in the Garden of Eden and sin was brought on the earth, we, yes, Adam and Eve did die spiritually. They had a glorified body. They had the covering of the glory of God on them. And when they disobeyed God, they lost that glorified body and that was a spiritual death. So then they had to live out the rest of their life in this fleshly body, which we're all cursed to do um, because of that. However, as in Romans 5, chapter 8, it says, I'm, I'm sorry, chapter 5, verse 8, it says, but God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Yeshua died for us. He had a plan of redemption already in place way back then. And that plan was for Yeshua to come and reverse the curse of what occurred. So that if we confess our sins and if we accept him as our Lord and Savior and we accept the gift of 
eternal life through him, that yes, we we will regain that glorified body when we leave this earthly existence. That that is what happens. Our spirit goes on, but we will we will live forever with the Lord. Amen. Amen. First John chapter one, verse nine says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in our readings too, um, the, the, we, we talked about teshuva repentance. Your repentance needs to be heartfelt. You don't come and ask to have your sins forgiven with the, the intention of going back out and doing the very same things. That's not repentant. You want to make that change. You you truly are sorry for anything that you have done that goes against God. And you, you're asking to be forgiven and to, and to change your ways, to live a more righteous, upright life. I'm going to give you that example when we get into Holy Communion. I'm going to read Psalm 51, which actually will talk a little bit about that repentance. Um, so I just wanted to make note of that, that just because your slate is wiped clean doesn't mean you, you that, that you can keep doing the same things over and over again. Yeshua died once. He's not going to come and die over and over and over again for you. So yes, you can, you, you, you need to take this seriously. The work was already done through Yeshua. Yes. But we need to respect that work that he did. He took on uh, the sins of the world. He took on also, when, when the Roman soldiers beat him, he took on all our afflictions and our illnesses so that we can say by his stripes we are healed as well. What an agonizing death our Lord and Savior went through because he loved us. And that's a love that we can't even begin to understand. It is, it's so deep. He could have stayed in heaven. He didn't have to come here and live like a live like a, a a man in the flesh and die in the flesh in the horrible most horrible way that he died, but it was for the glory of God. He died an awful death. He was buried. He was resurrected, which gives us the promise of resurrection as well, and that is our promise of eternal life. Now understand, he is coming again to rule and reign, and he will not come back. He is the only Messiah that was, is, and is to come. He has two natures. The first time he came was to come as the suffering servant, the one that died on the cross, the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. He had to clear, he had to, to, to provide that path of redemption for us. When he's coming back again, he's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's his second nature. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is coming to rule and reign. And whether you accept him now, uh, it doesn't, you know, it's, you're going to, you're going to know, and you're going to be very sorrowful if you don't, because every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Jesus, Yeshua is the king of kings, is the Lord of lords period. So even, even Satan and his demons will have to proclaim that as well, because they know who he is. But Satan hates humanity so much. And you need to understand why he hates you and me and every single, uh, single person on this planet. He's not doing you a favor. If you if, if you're one of these people that have been that have been serving this this loser, he is a loser. He was defeated already. He's only he's only promising you false promises and you know he wants to take you down to hell with them. You know, your lifetime on this planet is so short in comparison to eternity. Choose this day whom you will serve, a defeated foe or a victorious king who will rule and reign forever. You 
can become a child of God today. You can become part of the family of God. You can have eternal life today through Jesus. I can't save you. No one on this planet can save you. And of course, the devil can't save you either because he can't save himself. He's already, he's, he already has his sentence awaiting him. And you don't want to go with him. This is all deception that he gives people. Don't fall for the liar, uh, the father of all lies, the father of chaos, destruction. He has a threefold ministry to kill, to steal, and destroy. Don't follow a defeated foe. So this is one of the most important things that you can ever do in this lifetime while you have breath in, in your lungs. And, and our God loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have everlasting life. He did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but through him the world might be saved. He is the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life that no one will come to the Father but by me. You must, and we read that in, in Matthew, you must become like a little child to enter the kingdom of heaven. You must be born again. In John chapter 3, he tells Nicodemus, a Pharisee of his day, that you must be born again. And Nicodemus was like, how can that be? Do you, how, you can't enter, a grown man can't enter his mother's womb and be born again. And he said, no, flesh is flesh, spirit is spirit. You must be born again of spirit and water. And that's through his spirit. This is through, through, through uh, salvation that is provided by Yeshua only. He's the only one. The world will tell you there's many paths to get to heaven because there's so all these different pagan religions that are out there. They're not, they're, they're not biblical. They don't follow any biblical precept whatsoever. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful what reports you listen to. Don't rationalize. People like to rationalize the things that they do, but know the word of God and what is true and what is holy. I'm going to say a, a prayer. You can say this prayer with me. If you would like to be saved today, if you would like to accept Yeshua as your Lord and Savior, he loves you. He loves you so much that if you were the only person on this planet, he would have still died for you. But as so, he died for every single person on this planet. Even evil people have a chance to repent. It doesn't matter how far you have fallen. You can still be redeemed and saved up until the very last moment that you take breath in your lungs. I don't know that I play Russian roulette like that. Um, I don't know of anyone that has ever regretted coming to the Lord. We have that blessed assurance of eternal life. God is not a God that breaks promises. God is faithful and true. He cannot lie. He's not like mankind, and he's not like the devil who does these things. So know who God is. So if you'd like to accept the Lord as your Lord and Savior, Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and be saved, you could say this simple prayer with me right now. Dear God, I come to you today to confess that I'm a sinner and I am asking for forgiveness. I know that I can't save myself and I know, Yeshua, that you died on a cross for me and I thank you. I thank you for paying my sin debt in full. I'm asking for forgiveness. I'm accepting the gift of salvation and eternal life that you've offered. Help me to, to, to live a better life. I truly am repenting. I truly in my heart want to change my life and live a better life. I believe that Jesus, Yeshua, died on a cross, was buried, 
rose again and is sitting at the right hand of the Father now. I believe he is the Messiah. I believe he is the Savior, the only one. And I believe those words that he spoke, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one will come to the Father but through him because of everything that he's done. I declare that Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, is my Lord and Savior now and forever. I declare him to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and I thank you for everything, Jesus, Yeshua, that you have done to save me, to save the whole world through your giving up your life for me and everyone. Please send your Holy Spirit to live inside me, to guide me in all of your ways for the rest of my life. I believe through you and you alone, Yeshua, that I am saved. I am healed. I am born again, delivered and set free from sin and the consequences of sin. And I believe through you and you alone that I am healed and now healthy of mind, body, and soul. In Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus Christ, precious, powerful, most awesome name. Amen and amen. And and if you've said that prayer with me, welcome to the family of God. I am going to encourage you to get into a Bible-based church or Messianic congregation, one that teaches directly from the Bible and not bringing in other religions and worldly things, and, 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 and they stick to the Word of God. How do you know that they're sticking to the Word of God? Get a copy of the Bible. Start reading the Bible. Study the Word of God. It is so important for you to know what is inside that Bible. If you have a Bible, dust off the, and you haven't read it, dust off the cover. Open it up. Start reading it. You will get to know the heart of our Father, and He is now your Heavenly Father. If you've said this prayer, you are part of the family of God. You're a child of God, and the Creator of all things is now your Heavenly Father. How awesome is that? Amen? Amen. So, get a copy of the Bible. I'm not going to tell you what version of the Bible. I'm going to tell you to go to Bible Gateway or Bible Hub. Sample the different versions. And the one that you feel most comfortable with, I'm going to encourage you to get. Because that's the one that you would, would most likely uh, be committed to read. And uh, you can certainly read the Bible in a year. You can read it as you, you can read it in two years. You, you can read it faster than that. I've done it <laughs> faster than that. Um, as I went through a, a Bible survey class that was 12 weeks, we did the whole Bible um, and I did read through the whole Bible. But um, I'm going to encourage you to get into a Bible study. We have an online Bible study. Uh, as you heard, we're going to be reading the book of Nehemiah this upcoming week. Uh, and we did start the English Standard Version um, of the Bible in January. We had taken about two years before that to go through the Messianic Jewish Family Bible, Tree of Life Version, the TLV. And that's the version of the Bible that we use for Shabbat services. Um, but if you're joining a local church or Messianic congregation, most of them or all of them really should have a Bible study. You can get involved in in uh, in live and in real time meetings and d discussions of, of what you're reading in the Bible. And also read the Bible on your own. And before you do so, pray, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. And the Holy Spirit is an awesome teacher. Also, as a new believer, I'm going to encourage you to develop a prayer life. Um, also to to communicate with your Heavenly Father. Talk to Him. He loves to communicate with you. He wants relationship. He doesn't care about religion. So don't get caught up on, I need to get into this denomination or that denomination. Uh, denominations are not going to mean anything in heaven because that's that's another division. So don't get caught up in that. I'm just going to tell you, uh, our organization, Waymaker Messianic Jewish and Christian Center USA, we are non-denominational. We're, we're simply... Jewish and non-Jewish believers in Messiah and in Jesus and Yeshua uh, and, and follow the Bible. So I don't want to get into any divisions whatsoever. It's just, you know, we need to be following what's in the Bible and stick to the word of God. Amen? Amen. Well, with that being said, I am going to open with uh, Holy Communion. We're going to get prepared, first of all, I don't go right into 
taking the elements because it is so important for you to, to have a proper attitude for the Lord's Supper. And Yeshua instituted this in the upper room with his disciples before actually he was put to death. At, during during uh, Passover, uh, the Passover time, he met with the disciples and he instituted um, it, he instituted the the new covenant. Um, and he asked us, he asked the disciples, and this has been passed on to us to do this in remembrance of him. He died once, but we are honoring him by doing this in remembrance of him. So this is not something that we, we should be taking lightly. We need to prepare ourselves for coming to the Lord's Supper. Uh, we need to have a proper attitude. And we need to know that our sins, we have confessed our sins and our heart is right with God before we take those elements. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man or woman examine themselves and let them eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For, for those who eat and drink in an unworthy manner, eat and drink judgment to themselves, not discerning the Lord's body. Remember what he's done for us. It was not a small thing. It was it was huge. And, and we can't even begin to understand what was all heaped onto him and how agonizing that was. There are two ways that someone could take the Lord's Supper, and Paul makes this very clear to the members of the church that he's addressing, and it makes us it makes it very plain to us as well. The first type of person is the one that we want to be. Those who examine themselves before taking the supper, the ones who examine themselves before they partake of the supper are the ones who are taking it in a worthy manner. For what are they examining themselves for sin? Sin keeps us from a right relationship with the Lord, and when we examine ourselves, we are to confess it. And God has promised to forgive us and to restore us to a proper fellowship with Him. And we've already uh, stated that during the altar call, First John chapter one verse nine. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, we don't want to be the second type of person, and these are the people that are judged for not examining themselves. And this group is made up of individuals in the church who choose to come to church flippantly, not taking seriously sin that may be plaguing their lives. And they might be people who say they've accepted Christ as their Savior, but are living an uncommitted life. And they are those uh, that we sometimes call Sunday or Saturday believers, and, and those outside the, the church. Uh, community actually call these people hypocrites because this group is is basically living like the rest of the world and they're really not living a committed life. This group is also known to the pastor as individuals who sit soaked and sour in the pews. They are usually the ones who find fault in everything in the church and they are those who normally are not involved in daily Bible reading and there are many things that separate them from God. This type of person should reflect and repent before taking the Lord's Supper, for the Lord will not tolerate this behavior. There are consequences. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Many become weak and sickly, and this type of judgment is called chastening. And those individuals who have accepted Yeshua as their Savior, but are not living for the Lord, will be judged by the Lord. If any of you is living a life of sin, but is not being chastened or disciplined, check yourself to be sure that you are a true believer, that you are truly saved. And if you're not, you can go back and you can say that prayer and, and, and give your life to the Lord, holy and truly. The Bible says, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. We see many believers who are in this condition. So it is so important before you involve yourself in the remembrance, the remembrance of Yeshua's sacrifice, repent, be restored and renewed. And when I pause it for you to go get the elements, I, I want, I'm going to encourage you to take this time to confess your sins and pray to God and get your heart right with God during that time. Repent, be restored and renewed, and then we will take communion together. Many die and this judgment is terminal, and the Bible uses the term sleep when it talks about a believer's death 
And here we find that some believers die prematurely because of sin in their lives. So cut sin off at its root, for scripture tells us when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. The Corinthian church had some real problems, and the church today also has many of the same problems. There are believers who come to the Lord's table without examining their lives. They are challenging God's word, and they will lose. God is going to deal with this, and if you are here today and have not been examining your life for sin, I would challenge you today to examine your relationship with the Lord. Are you in fellowship with him? Are you keeping short accounts with him? If there is sin in your life, are you willing to confess it, turn from it, and follow the Lord more closely? Only you can make that decision. The Lord's Supper can be an experience of worship and worthiness, a time of repentance and remembrance, or it can be a time of disobedience, which will result in God's ultimate discipline. Let's spend some time in prayer and self-examination before we partake in the Lord's Supper. So I'm going to talk about the elements, and then I'm going to talk about repentance a little bit more, uh, and then we'll take a break, a little break for you to go get the elements and also to confess your sins to the Lord privately. And then we'll come back and take um, communion. So I want to talk about the elements. Um, and Yeshua instituted this with the disciples in the upper room uh, when he broke bread. And bread, uh, if you, um, I use matzah for the most part. Matzah is unleavened. And as we know, yeast is, represents sin, so um, there is no yeast in matzah, so it is perfect to use as, as the bread. Um, but if you don't have matzah, that's okay. You can, use, you can use regular snippet of bread or you can use a cracker because um, the Lord knows your heart and, and, and what the purpose is. And, and of course, this is to represent the, the bread um, is a symbol to represent the body of Christ, Yeshua, that died on the cross for our sins. And he suffered many abuses on his way to the cross. His body was in rough shape on the cross, and he suffered on the cross and gave his all for us. This is a symbol. This is not the body. It is a symbol. It's, it's to represent. Remember, Yeshua died a long time ago. We're doing this in remembrance. And there's some religions that actually have him mystically come down and die again. And that's not, that, that's not what we're to be doing. He did not ask us to do that. The cup. Now, you can use kosher wine. You can use grape juice. You can use water if, or juice if that's all you have. This is a representation of the blood that Yeshua shed on the cross for our sins. And the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And Yeshua had to shed his blood for us. And the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament looked ahead to the time when Yeshua would be the one shedding his blood for the sins of the world. This sacrifice was the final one needed to save the world. His blood was enough for all those who accept him as their personal savior. And Paul tells us that celebrating with these elements reminds the people of the church of Yeshua's sacrifice. We so often and so easily forget. We often complain about small sacrifices we must make, ignoring the incredible sacrifice of Yeshua's body and blood. So it is, the, these are the elements um, that you need to gather. Something to represent the, the bread and the cup. And um, I'm going to talk about true repentance um, because this is so important um, to not take this lightly. Psalm, I'm going to turn to Psalm 51. Very, very good example of repentance. Now, this was written by King David. And as we know, King David was known as a man after God's own heart. He was the sweet psalmist of Israel. He was the king of Israel. Prior to that, he, he was also the youth that defeated Goliath the giant because he had great faith in God that God was going to do it for him. And he was very angry that they were mocking the, you know, God, the God of Israel. Also, when he was young, he, he would sing songs to the Lord when he was tending his father's sheep. 
in the field. He had a wonderful ongoing he's, relationship with God. He cried out to God. He he leaned on God um, wholly and wholeheartedly. But there was a time, a dark time in David's life. It was brief, but um, because he totally repented, he loved God so much that it just crushed him. And you're going to hear that in, in Psalm 51. What happened was David um, actually caught, uh, actually saw Bathsheba, who was a, who was a married woman um, of one of the soldiers, one of his most faithful soldiers, Uriah the Hittite. Um, and he saw Bathsheba as beautiful and he started lusting after her, you know, thinking of her. And he had her called up to the palace and there he committed adultery. Um, and she became pregnant. Well, as you know, um, anyone that committed adultery would, would have been put to death. Yeah, I mean, that would have been the judgment. But the one that would have been doing the judgment was the king, actually. Uh, the king judged the people. So this was a really precarious situation. So uh, here he was, the king. He sinned against God, committed adultery, and he proceeded to weave that web um, and got himself all entangled because he wanted to cover that sin up. So he calls for Uriah to be pulled out of battle. There was a battle going on and to be brought back in the hopes that, you know, he was giving him leave. So he would go home, sleep with Bathsheba and they, the baby would be passed off as his. Well, that didn't happen. Uriah was a very loyal soldier and he didn't think it was fair that the rest of the soldiers that were around the palace were not able to go home. So he stayed with his fellow soldiers. So that perplexed David. He, he, he had a feast with him. And also um, got him drunk in hopes that he would go uh, to be with Bathsheba. Well, that still did not happen. And so David, again, was very perplexed. So he wrote orders, which he gave to Uriah to take back to, to take back. And for, and the orders were that Uriah was to be placed in the thick of the battle and he would be killed. And then he would marry Bathsheba and everything would be all covered up and in, in a nice little, nice little package there. Well, Uriah actually took those orders back and he was very faithful and very, you know, very um, respectful of David. He did not, he could have opened it up and saw uh, what was written, but he didn't. And yes, he was placed in the thick of the battle and he did die in battle. And David went on to marry Bathsheba. Well, then God spoke to Nathan the prophet and, and sent him to David to confront him on what he had done. I mean, he went as far as, as, as planning somebody's murder. It, you know, he lied, he covered, you know, he, he committed adultery, lied, covered it up, tried to cover it up, and then, then went as far as to do that. And so he was confronted. And when it all hit David, he was totally crushed. And you're going to hear the, the, the bones that you have broken. Uh, you're going to hear this in, in Psalm 51, how he is pleading to God. He did not want to lose his relationship with God and was asking for forgiveness. And he truly meant that. He truly meant that and did not go back to doing this ever again uh, because he loved God so much and had such a good relationship with God. So this is Psalm 51. I'm going to read this and you're going to hear his plea to God and hear, um, hear how he's speaks to God. Create in me a clean heart, O God, to the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Flood out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. 
Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. I mean your joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God, of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not displease. despise. Do good design in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. David understood, you know, he was very rich. He could have, he could have given tons of sacrifices, burnt offerings, and what have you uh, on the altar. But that's not what God wanted. God wanted repentance. He wanted his heart. He wanted him to, to show that he was sorry for the sins that he had committed. And then, and only then after he forgave him, would he accept any offerings. So that is repentance, an example of true repentance. And once David confessed his sin and was forgiven, he did not go back. He did not commit adultery with anybody else. So I'm going to pause it now for you to get the elements together and to, to pray to the Lord, to confess your sins, and to make sure that your heart is right with, with the Lord before you we do uh, the the Holy Communion and come to the Lord's table and, and remember what Yeshua did for us. So I'm going to pause it now for you to do so. Okay. We're going to take communion together now that you have gathered the elements and, and, and confessed your sin and prayed to the Lord. We're ready to do so. And will you bow your heads in prayer with me now? Father God, we come to this table as your guests, resting only in the worthiness of your Son. As we look upon the emblems of our Savior's death, may we remember why he died, to cleanse and to heal, to satisfy your righteousness and justice. We remember his eternal love and boundless grace. May we receive the assurance of forgiveness, eternal life, and the hope of glory. As the bread and cup nourish our body, so may your indwelling Holy Spirit strengthen our soul until the day of Yeshua's appearing when we will hunger and thirst no more and sit with him at, heavenly, at his heavenly table. Yeshua, we thank you. We thank you for paying our sin debt in full, for giving us that path to redemption that we could never get for ourselves because we couldn't ever save ourselves. You are the only way, the truth in the life and we love you so much Yeshua for everything that you have done for us in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach Jesus Christ Amen and Amen say with me now the Lord's Prayer our Father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The bread. Take that bread into, into your hand now. Remember, this is a representation of the body that was broken for you. The Lord, Yeshua, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and then he had given thanks. He broke it and said, take Eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. The cup. This is a representation of the blood that was shed for the remissions of sin. The blood that Yeshua poured out for each and every one of us. 
In the same manner, Yeshua also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink, drink it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that you gave your only begotten Son. And we love you, Yeshua. For you died for each and every one of us and paid our sin debt in full. And that is love that we can't even begin to understand. But we do love you. We love you for everything that you've done for us. For providing the road to redemption, the gift of salvation and eternal life. You are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords, and we honor you now and forever. In the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, Amen and Amen. Now may you walk in the light as he is in the light. May you have fellowship with one another for the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. Now, may the grace of the Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, and the love of God and the communion of the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Amen and Amen. And now we will close Shabbat service for this week. As Shabbat draws to an end, the aroma of sweet spices lingers as the flame is extinguished until next week. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord at an eye is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Blessed are you at an eye, our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. And blessed are you at an eye, our God, King of the universe, who creates the various spices. Blessed are you at an eye, our God, King of the universe, who creates the lights of fire. And blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who distinguishes between holy and secular. The ironic blessing, the priestly blessing, is found in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 to 27. This is when the Lord spoke to Moses, telling Moses to speak to Aaron and to his son, saying uh, a, a particular blessing for the children of Israel. And I'm going to say that in just a moment. Um, and in, in saying this blessing, he also said, and they shall put my name upon the, the children of Israel and I will bless them. As a child of most high God, as a member of the family of God, this is a blessing for you as well. I'm going to say it in Hebrew first, and then I'm going to say it in English. In Hebrew, it goes like this. Ivarekaka Adonai ve'ishmareka, ya'e Adonai paravaleka. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom. Amen and amen. Shavuot Tov, everyone. Have a good week. God bless each and every one of you. Hope to see you um, uh, with Yom Kippur and also the Bible study, and also our live and real-time uh, meeting, Tuesday evening, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. God bless y'all. See you soon.